Okay, thank you everybody for joining the Bridgeport Public Library. We're excited to have J.W. Ocker here to talk about his new book, Cult Following. J.W. Ocker, Ocker is, a, is an award, Edgar Award-winning travel writer, horror novelist, and blogger. His previous nonfiction books include Poe Land, The New England Grimpendium, and The New York Grimpendium, A Season of the Witch, The New York Times Reviewed Cursed Objects, and the United States of Cryptid. He is the creator of the blog and podcast, Otis, Odd Things I've Seen. Uh, and the website is oddthingsiveseen.com. And we'll get through his presentation. Awesome. Let me start sharing my screen here. Give me two seconds. <laughs> And... All right, Jeff, can you give me a check to make sure you see my large red slide? Yep. Awesome. So I'm really excited to talk to you guys about um, cults tonight, the fascinating, disturbing, intriguing, interesting world of cults. Um, I've never given this talk before. This is the very first time I've tried to actually do a talk around my book. So, you know, <laughs> give me a little bit of leeway if I mess things up. Uh, it, it is based on my book, Cult Following. Cult Following came out last week, or last month, sorry, last month. And uh, it's about 30 of the most interesting cults I could find stories about. Um, something about their stories that was intriguing or different from other cults. However, when I first started the project, I started with a list of over 100 cults. Uh, there are tens of thousands of cults out there. But I started with a list of about 100 that I thought were unique enough. And then got that down to 60 and then decided I wanted to go deeper into the cult. So I wanted more, more space in the book. So we got down from 60 to 30. So these 30 are, are pretty refined as far as the, the type of interest in these uh, type of interesting cults I could find. And honestly, it wasn't too hard to go from 100 to 30 uh, because what I learned at, at the, in the beginning stages of this book is that a lot of cults follow the same paradigms. Uh, there's not a lot of variation in between cults. Like if, you, if, you're, if you've heard about a UFO cult, You've probably heard about all the UFO cults. If it's a doomsday cult, if you've seen one doomsday cult, you've seen them all. So it's um it's 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 interesting how similar they are. So what I've done for tonight is put together seven kind of characteristics of, of cults from my experience researching them. Right, this isn't from you know I'm not a scientist, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a sociologist, I'm not I don't have a degree in religion, but just from my own research of digging into cults for you know a year and a half, two years. These are seven characteristics. Now, I'll call them red flags because, you know, a lot of times we think of cults as dangerous and want to avoid them. Um, but the caveat is, even though these are seven red flags about cults, none of them will help you avoid a cult. Now, I'll, I'll, I'm going to hold off on explaining that to the end because I want to deal with the red flags first. But once I get through all seven red flags, I'll explain to you why these are going to be of zero help to you whatsoever <laughs> to stay away from cults or to not join them or to keep people out of them or your friends out of them or whatever. Completely unhelpful at the end of the day. Um, so I'll start to start to start into that. Um, but first, of course, of course, of course, I've got to define what is a cult, because this is a very kind of, uh, you know, not an easy definition to land on uh, ordinarily. At least that, that's the conventional wisdom. Right. Um, you know, even academics, when they write about cults these days, they don't like the word cult because it's too pejorative. So they use phrases like emerging religion and new, newly uh, newly formed religion, NFR. Um, because again, cult is just too pe pejorative. And in my experience, so I write a lot of nonfiction and with nonfiction, I write a lot of, about people and about institutions. And I interview a lot of people and I post those interviews or publish those interviews. So I'm always in danger of, um, libel being sued for libel. Nonfiction is a dangerous business. Uh, so what happens is usually by the end of the book, when I'm done, it's all done. Everything's been put together. The lawyers come in and they want to make sure everything I, everything I say in there is not going to get them and us sued. Um, this time though, for the first time in 15 years of writing nonfiction books, the lawyers came in at the very beginning and they said, you know, they wanted to make sure that, um, I was careful with how I use the word cult and who I call the cult, um, and how I define cult. Because again, I called the wrong group and they were litigious, litigiousness, they were litigious. Um, it could be big trouble for all of us. So it's a very contentious definition of what is a cult. Um, so what I'm going to do is, what I did first, of course, like you should do, is I went to the dictionary. So what is a cult? 
This is Merriam-Webster's definition. It's a religion regarded as unorthodox or spur spur spurious. Spurious. Basically, it's a minor, uh, strange religion is what they define a cult as in Merriam-Webster, which is a fine definition. I think that fits. It's decent. But it doesn't quite get at why we're so obsessed with cults, why we're so fascinated with cults. And I'll give you an example of that, right? This is my this is my Netflix screen. I just typed in the word cult documentary, and it just poured in, right? Obviously, not all these are cult documentaries. Cult of Chucky is a series. But, you know, all these lines went forever. They all scrolled down forever and ever. We are obsessed with learning about cults and learning the stories of cults and what goes behind the scenes with cults. We, we want to know everything about cults. So it, it feels like that definition from Merriam-Webster is does it's not enough right it's not, if these are just like minor strange groups we wouldn't be this obsessed there has to be more than that so i went you know up the chain up the hierarchy of of, of dictionaries and i went to the uh, oed the oxford english dictionary and their definition is a relatively small group of people uh having especially religious beliefs or practices regarded by others as strange or sinister or as exercising excessive control over members. Now we're getting to it, right? Now we're getting to the fascination, right? Strange or sinister. Sinister is important, right? Salacious is another good one. Excessive control. Um, all of these kind of get at why anytime you hear about somebody going into a cult or you hear about a new cult getting busted or some new scandal around a cult, we're interested. However, this definition still wasn't enough for me to use practically or, you know, just to get my, wrap my head around the concept of cults. That's because most of the terms in this definition need definitions, right? What is excessive control? What if it's just a little bit of control? Is it a cult if they have a little bit of control? Um, especially religious, that's kind of, that sticks out, right? Sinister, you got to define sinister, right? What do you mean by sinister? So there's just too much confusion that's for me that practically used. So I came up with my own definition of cult. This is mine again. I didn't pull this from anybody. This is just mine. And that is a cult is an unsuccessful religion. Now, um, a lot of times... You know, you know, people want to define cults and religions, religions as legitimate, cults as illegitimate. But really, in my in my in my experience researching and visiting and interviewing, religions and cults are pretty similar. The only difference is one um, has stuck around, one is successful, one is um, you know has weathered all the vicissitudes. Because every single religion you ever heard of, Catholicism, Protestantism, all started with a small group with weird ideas. They all started that way, right? Sometime back in time, sometimes thousands of years ago, but they all started as a small group with weird ideas. They're conventionally, you know, strange ideas. And uh, then grew over time and became bigger and bigger and bigger and became juggernauts and became too big to fail and all that. So um, to do that, they got to weather a lot of controversies, right? Usually what takes down a cult is, you know, it relies too much on its leader. So the leader, if the leader, you know, uh, dies, the cult can dissolve. If the leader goes to jail, the cult can dissolve. If there are controversies or scandals that are unveiled to the public, um, that can be the death of a cult. And a religion has, has what a religion has done is weathered all of those successfully. So let me show you what I mean, right? So here's a bunch of scandals from the, from the, from the annals of religion, right? We have that up, up in the corner representing the Catholic abuse uh, scandal, right? This huge, 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 huge. This would have taken down any smaller organization, but Catholicism, because it's so big, because it's so spread apart, they could, and it was hard for them, they had to do a lot of work on this one, but they could cut out the bad parts, isolate them, deal with them, and not harm the body as a whole, right? The Crusades, right? That's a pretty pretty dark spot on a, on a religion's record, um, and yet, you know, survived. Protestants, they have a lot of fun with um, TV evangelists, right? Uh, the Bakers and Swaggerts. Falwell Jr. there in the bottom corner, um, who ran Liberty University after his father started it, got involved in a sex scandal, tax, also often tax scandals. It's all, they, all, they all fall for the same temptations. But what happens every single time is those people get ostracized, more, more or less, not always, but they get ostracized and the religion keeps going. It's just too big to fail. If you know Jimmy Swaggart only had 200 followers uh, during his scandal, they would have fallen apart. There would be no, there would be no, there would be no Swaggart, uh, um, Swaggart cult anymore but because he was part of a larger body um that much of it was irrelevant to him it could continue without too much of a black mark on its on its history scientology so this is a good one right so i know a lot of you were thinking when i said certain certain cults could be litigious you were thinking scientology and you were right uh, a lot of people consider scientology a cult but by my definition of an un as an unsuccessful religion scientology is a religion um they've been around long enough and they have weathered a ton of scandals and not just all the recent celebrity whistleblowing that's going on um, when they first made land they started out on a boat <laughs> in the water and then they had their first headquarters 
um, in, uh, in a hotel on in Clearwater, um, Florida, in the same hotel, actually, that the Rolling Stones wrote Can't, uh, Can't Get No Satisfaction, actually. They were raided by the FBI. Like, right away, they were raided by the FBI because they were trying to take over the town through seditious means. Um, they would eventually take over the town anyway, but through legal means by just buying property. But back then, they were actually trying to do it by, you know, paying off politicians and, and, and doing all these kind of underhanded practices. And you know what? They survived as a group. They are still around. They're still pretty powerful. Uh, they have no sign of going away. So to me, they're kind of successful, or they are successful. So that if you can weather controversies and continue, you're a mainstream religion. If you don't weather them, you're a cult. So that's kind of simple for my definition. I know, you know, I've talked to people who are religious, you know, Catholics and Baptists and, um, you know, Lutherans. And if I ask them the difference between them and a cult, what they say is, well, they say two things. One, this, one they, they, they make a claim to history, right? We've been around for a very long time, which is, what, is the one I agree with, right? I'm like, yep, that's a, that's a good reason why you're a religion and not a cult. But their other one is just what we believe is true and what they believe is false, right? And that's a harder one for an outsider or a, or, or a dictionary to really define or police or really use. It's, it's, a great, it's okay to use personally. It's a, great, it's a great way to differentiate personally, but one's true and one's not. It's, not, it's just not something we can use to differentiate between a cult and a religion. Because again, even the major religions also often have opposing tenets. So which one of those two is right, right? So that's kind of my definition. It's just an unsuccessful religion. Um, or to be more precise, a lot of the cults I'm going to tell you about tonight, you know, were unsuccessful. They ended. But some haven't ended yet. They just seem to be tending toward unsuccess. So you can kind of call it in advance almost that they, that they won't survive. And if they do, then, you know, they, they graduate from cult or emerging religion, as the academics say, into full-fledged, mainstream, too big to fail religion. All right. So that's my introduction. That's what cults are. That's kind of the bedrock. That's where I'm coming from. That's where I'm telling you. And I could be wrong about all that stuff, but that's where I'm coming from when I talk about cults. Just so use those. All right. Now we're going to get to the seven, the seven red flags of a cult that will not at all help you discern that it's a cult, <laughs> or at least it won't, it won't protect you from them. Uh, number one is that the rules of the organization do not apply to its leader. Now we we have this in um, in, in culture, right? We call it uh, nobody is above the law. Uh, we believe that. However, practically, we also know that if you're rich enough, or famous enough, or influential enough, you can't, you're above the law. <laughs> Which is just a, it's just a sad part of a society. However, the important part here is we at least have a fiction that you're not right. We at least all of us believe, or at least kind of maintain the idea that nobody's above the law we don't just say hey listen that's our president or that's our um um our that famous that's our favorite musician or that's our senator they are above the law they can do whatever they want and i'm okay with that we don't do that we say they're not above the law even if they are often um but the other thing we do though is at some point even their wealth and fame won't help them at some point they are not above the law right we're seeing this with um with the diddy right he spent decades flouting the law in very nefarious ways, apparently, allegedly. Um, and now it, he's done. It, he's gone too far. Too much has come out. And now we have to say, okay, despite your fame, despite your riches, despite your influence, we have to take care of you. We have to. We have to fix the situation. So in our society, nobody's above the law is pretty much a truism, even when it's not true. So in cults, it's, not, it's there's not even the pre pretense that it's true. Leaders have their own set of rules. Followers have their own set of rules, and everybody's okay with that. Um, so that's how you know that the fact that everybody's okay with it is the problem. That's how you know that's kind of a red flag for a cult. So I'll show you a couple examples. Number one, David Koretsch, the Branch Davidians. We're starting starting out with a hit, right? Starting out with a very famous cult. Um, this is a this is the one that rose to prominence during a you know a fatal standoff, the Waco siege, when a bunch of armed uh, Branch Davidians faced off against federal and local and people died and there was fires and tanks and it was awful and it was <laughs> it's a very it's a very interesting story very nuanced um very terrifying to the average american watching you know federal tanks crash a private building however we don't have to deal with that tonight fortunately we don't have to talk about it we don't have to dig into it uh it's a much more complicated story i bring up koresh and his um his followers the Div branch davidians because he had his own set of rules one of his most uh, egregious probably was that, you know, everybody's wife in the organization and everybody's daughter mostly was his. So he was able to have sex with anybody while his male followers had to be celibate. So that was obviously two sets of rules. And it, his rationalization for that for his group was that he was trying to sire some like 
group, new group of prophets or something like that that only he could do. And that's kind of how he explained it. But again, that's a pretty egregious gulf between follower and leader when he can have all the women and every man has to stay celibate. It's very strange. And again, I can't say that the followers were okay with that, but they followed along with that blatant um, um, levels of rules, right? They, they at least followed along with it. So that's kind of an example of what I'm talking about. If it's that egregious and that open and that okay, that's a red flag that is probably a cult, which means, again, in my definition, that they are trending toward unsuccess. And in this case, they trended right into unsuccess, right? They, uh, they're they still around today, but in a much different form, different people, different leaders. It's basically a new group at the end of the day. Um, and, and, and the Branch Davidians, as we knew them under David Koresh, are no longer. They are failed. Another example, the Rajneesh movement. Uh, Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh was an Indian guru, right? Um, he got very popular in, in, in India, got very popular during the 60s and 70s, during the counterculture era of the U.S. because a lot of people in the U.S. Was, were looking for alternate alternate ways to go about life, right? They were tired of the, the systems in place, and they wanted something new and different, more freeing, more progressive, less uh, about money and stuff. So they would, you know, go to India and find these these gurus who were preaching those kinds of ideas and kind of like, you know, follow them around. Rajneesh was interesting because he he um kind of preached what what we call these days a prosperity gospel almost. He was okay with riches. He was okay with the pursuit of money. These weren't bad things in his ideology. So he really appealed to a certain sub, sub subset of Americans who were had had tendings toward counterculture. Were hippies but also wanted to protect their stock portfolio. So they were like this, this combination hippie yuppie, right? Um, they really liked Rajneesh. And Rajneesh eventually moved from India to Oregon, set up a commune there. He moved because the Indian authorities were starting to suspect him of certain, certain laws he was breaking. Uh, but also he just wanted to come to America, right? America is the land of prosperity, the land of opportunity, all those things that kind of appealed to him and what he was what he was uh, preaching. So they came to Oregon, Oregon, Oregon. They came to Oregon, set up a commune, and um, <laughs> he lived a wildly different life than his followers. He had a collection of almost a hundred Rolls Royces that were his personally, his personal fleet. It was almost, I think he missed having the world record for a fleet of Rolls Royces by only a few. Um, but he had these things blatantly. He would drive them around the commune and all the followers would line up and applaud and lay flowers on the hood of the, whatever car he was driving that day. It was a different car every day. He would wear uh, flashy Rolexes. He loved, loved, loved ostentatious shows of wealth. But it was wealth that his followers did not have at all. So again, uh, in this case, he wasn't preaching and he wasn't acting anti to what he was preaching, but he was living a much different life under different rules than his followers. Um, they were interesting. The, the Rajneesh movement is the most interesting because they're the first ever, <laughs> they performed the first ever bioterrorism attack on, uh, American soil. Now bioterrorism, we always think, you know, somebody laces the water with some kind of plague or, or drugs or whatever, and takes out entire populations. They didn't do that. They laced salad bars with listeria. <laughs> Basically they lay salad bars and produce sections with listeria because they were trying to kind of get into the local governments and try to kind of expand their influence locally there in Oregon. They were kind of failing just by being elected naturally. So, so they um, started trying to poison the populace and lower the voter tally. I don't think anybody died because of it, but a ton of people got sick. And that was the beginning of the end for the Rajneesh movement. Eventually he would have to leave uh, Rajneesh, go back to India, rebrand himself as Asho, and then start his whatever new guru teachings uh, over there after the failed attempt at a religion here in the U.S. called the Rajneesh movement. So there you go. There's two examples of like leaders living under much different rules than their followers. So if you see that, red flag. Red flag number two, the leader sees themselves as preternaturally unique or gifted. Now, to be a leader takes a certain certain set of skills, right? It takes um, self-belief. It takes certain oratory skills. It takes certain decision-making skills. It takes certain... Um, certain just bearing skills. It takes a set of skills to be a leader that not everybody has. However, there are a ton of leaders in the world. These aren't unique skills. A lot of people have them. There's a lot of leaders in the world. Um, so even though it takes a unique set of skills to be a leader, it's not unique to be a leader, right? That's just something we have. 
For co-leaders, though, for some reason, they have to be unique on this planet so that you will hear things about them that make them not just a good leader or good at leading, I should say, um, but unique, right? So for instance, if I was to grab every single cult leader in the history of the world who proclaimed to be the reincarnation of Jesus Christ, I could start my own cult full of Jesus Christ's cult leaders. They just, for some reason, always, always, always want to say that they are Jesus Christ returned. Partially it's because they want to kind of insert themselves in the flow of history, find a precedent for themselves, because again, most cults just suddenly appear. So they want some kind of like foundation to set them on. But mostly it's because the leader wants to be unique. They want to be the only person that does this. And the Jesus Christ example is really broad because there's so many. I couldn't even give you, you know, even just one story about that because there's so many. But there's another good story of a leader who professed to be unique among, among people. And that's this dude, Keith Rainier from Nexium. This is a rel this is a recent cult. This is a 21st century cult. Um they um were interesting because um well they got in the news really because well, let me start off with that. They were basically a pyramid scheme. They were they were a self-help cult. Cuz a lot of a lot of cults don't have to be religious. It doesn't have to be Christian tenets or Muslim tenets. It can just be self-help. I there's diet cults in this book. There are um, foot worshiping cults in this book. There are all kinds of cults. You can build an ideology around anything and we do. In this case, though, he was really into uh, corporate self-help. He would run seminars, and very, very important, very wealthy, very famous people would attend his seminars. But what those seminars were at the end were a pyramid scheme. He was very much into pyramid schemes, schemes Keith Rainier. He was in Amway. He started his own pyramid scheme, uh, scheme in the state of New York that eventually he got, he got in trouble for, and the state came after him. He had to pay a fine and, and, and dismantle the business. Uh, but eventually he landed on the Nexium scheme that's, you know, you know, not totally classified as a pyramid scheme. And it was, it was extremely successful at it. Again, like I said, major CEOs came and the scions of politicians uh, across North America. Um, but he wasn't just, you know, helping people self-actualize and self-realize. What he was hiding underneath was basically sex trafficking. I mean, it always, almost always comes down. If the, the leader of a cult is a male, it almost always comes down to sex in some way. In this case, he was sex trafficking. He was um, taking advantage of women. He was branding them with his initials, for goodness sakes. And that really brought this cult to the fore. To the, once it got busted and everything got shown. Um, that plus, I think there were a couple of uh, Hollywood starlets involved in this that were like in uh, TV shows. Um, they weren't major stars, but they were you know famous enough to, to be a hook for the media to tell a story around. But anyway, so Keith Rainier, you know, pyramid scheme um, fan and, and sex trafficker. This guy <laughs> would mythologize himself. And it was in all their brochures. All of his followers would talk about him in certain ways. He had two facts that he liked to expound about himself. The first is that he held the Guinness World Record for highest IQ of anybody on the planet. So that was one thing about him. The other thing was he touted himself as the most ethical man on the planet. So he had all the smarts. And all the morals somehow tied together in one complete pa the spectacled package. Um, and again, he had to self-mythologize self -mythologize himself. He couldn't just say, I'm a good leader. I know how to run a business. I know I know a good pyramid scheme. He had to make himself so unique um, because, again, he had to, some of it's ego, but some of it is maintaining a special place and drawing those adherents to him that he had to be unique, right? So that's another red flag. If the leader says things about themselves that only apply to themselves on the planet. They're they're the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. They're the smartest man on the planet. Then you know that these guys are more than just leaders. Uh, they, just more, they have more than just the qualities of leadership. They have the qualities of cult leadership. All right, three, three, three. The organization is isolated either geographically or socially. So this is a pretty, pretty, um, pretty good tenet, right? This is the fishbowl effect, right? I don't know if you ever had this experience. If you're you, you hang out with a, good, good, with a group of friends for a while, and they all love this one particular movie, this one particular song, and you all kind of start loving it, and it's like this echo chamber of backing back and back and forth of how much you love it, and then you end up with, end up with another group of friends at some point, and they all hate that movie. They all think it's silly or whatever, and suddenly you start thinking it's silly too because that echo chamber keeps bouncing back these ideas over and over again, and that's very important in a cult because again. They re that that's a bit of control, right? If they can control the, the ideology and you with the ideology, then you're easier to control. And um, any kind of dissenting opinion or other ideology or, or objective facts that kind of counteract it, that echo chamber is broken up and suddenly people are questioning, asking questions and digging deeper. And that's something you do not want if you're just looking for blind followers. You do not want that kind of like, um, you know, open-mindedness at all. So the way you do that typically is to isolate your organization. You want to keep them away from those 
any any opposing ideologies, away from any dissenting opinions, away from any, you know, sincere questions even. And the easiest way to do that is geographically, right? You take your, and this happens with a lot of cults, you take them to the mountains, you take them out to the plains, you take them out to the desert, uh, which was the uh, modus operandi of Home of Truth uh, run by Mary Ogden. Um so Mary, uh, she was she was a New England she was a New Jersey socialite. Uh, she wasn't really a cult leader at first, and then her husband dies of cancer, and she gets involved in spiritualism because this was the you know, 19th century. A lot of people got involved in spiritualism, didn't want to see loved ones go, wanted to know or believe that they were still around, they could be communicated with, and they weren't gone forever um, or gone until they die or whatever whatever the belief system was. And she became a big proponent of spiritualism, and somehow started garnering a following around the spiritualism. Partially because she started saying things like she could, she could help people be immortal. This is another tenet. This isn't in like my list of seven tonight, but almost every single cult says they could provide immortality. Actually, every religion says they can provide immortality, right? Cults are usually more direct and said they can provide it on this earth. Every other religion is like, after you die, you're still immortal. Um, in this case, that's, you know, a very appealing message to us, you know, dying creatures. But at some point, she started having these visions of a place she wanted to take her group to. And that place was a desert area. And they found it in Utah. So they all went up to Utah, started building their own commune. Again, the reason why every single cult has a commune is this reason, the fishbowl reason. They want to keep uh, all ideologies contained, right, or, or, or guarded against. So she came, she went there, started her group, you know, started her own newsletter. That's pretty much their only source of information was her newsletter. Um, she would actually get messages from the dead on her typewriter. That's her standing, sitting in front of her typewriter. So she was kind of an auto writer. She'd hear messages from the dead, type them out. Put them in our newsletter. So anyway, uh, and it lasted a while. It lasted a lot longer than you think it would um, out there in the in the harsh desert until somebody died. And the second somebody dies, the 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 jig is up. Especially if you are promoting immortality. In this case, it wasn't Mary Ogden. It was one of her followers who actually joined because they had a um, a fatal disease. I think it was cancer, and they wanted to come and and live forever. They wanted to beat the disease. So Mary uh, got worried that her entire group would fall apart. So she hid the body and had some some close acolytes um, start <laughs> washing the body in milk and also giving it milk en en enemas. So she would, you know, just trying to pretend this body was still alive and it would resurrect any second and they just needed to care for it for a while. Eventually, though, because that person disappeared, relatives finally came to the desert, asked about her, enough questions were asked, the authorities got involved, and boom, there blew up Mary Ogden's home of truth. But again, most of that only worked because she moved them out to the desert where they couldn't get any information, couldn't see family or friends. And that was kind of a well-made fishbowl until internal, something internal happened that broke them. Um, however, it doesn't have to be a geographical isolation, which this, this, is a, so this is pretty much obvious. I mean, this is you guys know this. You didn't write a book about cults. But what surprised me was it doesn't just have to be geographical. You can isolate people so, in other ways. And where I learned that was the Sullivan Institute, also called the Slovenians, run by a man named Saul Newman. His cult was located in a few buildings in the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Manhattan is the least fishbowl place you could possibly be. It's full of tons of people, and they're all diverse and diverse opinions and diverse histories and diverse religions. Uh, most of his most of his followers were white collar doctors, lawyers. These people were in the real world every single day, interacting with people. But somehow he was able to socially and psychologically bubble wrap them so that they weren't influenced for decades. Um, and that's because this cult was a cult of psychology. Um, he believed, so his name is Newman. The name of the the, the cult is the, the Sullivanians or the Sullivan Institute because he based his ideas on this man, on this psychologist named Andrew Sullivan, who thought that a lot of ills in society, a lot of the anxieties, a lot of the social ills, were because of you know how much influence our families have on us. Um, Saul Newman took that even further to extremes. And by the time he named his his organization, the Sullivan Institute, Andrew Sullivan was dead. He would never have wanted his name on a cult or, or his ideas taken to such extremes. But Saul believed that the nuclear family was the cause of all else. So it should be abolished. If you could get rid of the nuclear, nuclear family, we would be better as a society. So he would force people to break up. He'd break up families in his few buildings to go into Manhattan. He would have brand new mothers separate them from their babies. He'd let them breastfeed for a few minutes a day, but separate them from their babies. He would encourage people to um, have adults, what he called adult sleepovers, right? He didn't want two people to pair up. Even if they weren't making a family, he didn't want two people to pair up because that became a family unit. He wanted it almost to be free love. And this was this was actually pretty um, appealing to his members because what they were getting was 
free love. They were getting free therapy because it was a psychology cult. And they were getting free rent in uh, Manhattan. Um, even Jackson, Jackson Pollock, the painter, joined uh, the Sullivanians because he, well, either he liked the ideology or he just wanted to cheat on his wife. It's a little bit, you know, it could have gone either way with him. But um, he was able to keep that thing going for a very long time, even though they were surrounded by the outside world at all times. The way that the Sullivan Institute broke up is just the nuclear family reasserted itself. Oh, by the way, even though he believed in the uh, that the nuclear family was the cause of all ills, it didn't apply to him. So where he lived in the building, he kept his family near him. His kids were near him. Um, so again, the rules didn't apply to him like they applied to his followers. But again, the nuclear family eventually reasserted itself. Like certain mom, moms didn't want to leave their kids. She, they fought back and the kids grew up in that system, wanted to know who their parents were. And eventually uh, it all fell apart. I think in the 90s is when it fell apart. And the Sullivan Institute became an unsuccessful religion, a cult. Or it didn't become one. Just were always one. And, and then the ending kind of validated that assumption. All right, moving on to number four. Uh, the organization acts according to urgent pr predictions of an impending world-changing event. This is important. This is how you, this is why every almost every single cult names a date. They literally name the date of the apocalypse or when the when the aliens are coming or when Christ returns or when the great tribulation tribulation happens. They will name a date down to the day. Um, and this is just human nature, right? This is just, uh, you know, we are, we are in election season right now, right? So every single problem in society and on the planet is now exacerbated, right? Uh, any, you know, immigration is now a crisis. Education is now a crisis. The economy is now a crisis. The climate is now a crisis. Everything's a crisis. And if you like me, I will solve them all in four years or less, right? Um, that, obviously, they can't solve anything in four years. It's really not just giant, giant things. But if you can put all the urgency on those things and say they're any second they're about to topple, then you know you can get people voting for you. So this is something that happens in everyday society, and this helps cult leaders um, grow followings. Um, um, helps cult leaders grow followings. So interestingly enough, so every single one of those dates that every cult leader has ever named has never happened. Right? The aliens never came. Uh, Christ never returned. Uh, World War Three never happened. The nuclear bombs didn't go off uh, uh, across the world. So we know they were always wrong, um, uh, except, you know, that didn't always dissolve cults. Um, and because of that, we we learned this term called cognitive dissonance, right? Where you could hold two opposing ideas in your head at the same time, right? And those two opposing ideas could completely counteract each other, and yet you could believe them both. You can believe two ideas that cannot be believed at the same time because the human mind is a wondrous thing. Um, but we, we know it as cognitive dissonance. But the reason we have a name for that concept is because of a cult. I'm going to tell you about that cult right now. It's a UFO cult. I've been waiting for you to talk about a UFO cult all night. This UFO cult was a pretty minor one, actually. I wouldn't have put it in the book if it wasn't for its, its connection to cognitive dissonance. Very minor, very small, uh, located in Chicago. They're called the Seekers, run by Dorothy Martin. She joined up with this guy named Charles Lofhead, who was basically the, the marketing guru behind the, behind the group. Um, she named a date. It's basically Christmas. It's a little more complicated than that, but I'll skip all the complications. But basically, there's a date in Christmas that the aliens are going to come and take the chosen faithful away before cataclysm hit the planet. Um, the only thing you got to do is believe and be there and also have no metal in your clothes. That was very important. If you had metal in your clothes, whatever um, beam that the uh, aliens used to, to draw you in, something bad would happen. I don't know what how fillings worked in that, but you couldn't have any metal in your clothes. So, you know, they, they announced the date way in advance because, again, they were – evangelizing they were kind of they were they were raising their numbers and that came across the, the got in the papers and that came across the desk of a researcher in minnesota named leon fassinger so he said oh my goodness this is a chance to study a cult in real time the next day the day after the prediction doesn't come true and have direct data so he sent a team of researchers to infiltrate the seekers and become you know cult members basically um which which honestly you know it's the, the, that methodology is a little suspect, right? Because they definitely swelled the ranks of this small cult uh, and gave gave the seekers more confidence and more validity just by joining them. But anyway, they were involved. So they were, you know, they were listening to stuff. They'd run to the bathroom and take notes. They would, you know, send missives back to Minnesota uh, and just kind of gather all this data of a cult on the edge of being wrong, right? Um, so that happened. It happened like Christmas or Christmas Eve, something like that. Um, snowy, cold Chicago Christmas. They were outside their house, the Seekers. They were singing Christmas carols, and they were surrounded by cult members and researchers, unbeknownst to them, 
they were also surrounded by all the looky loos, all the people coming out to see this strange exhibit and to to watch what happens when the UFOs don't come or to see if the UFOs come, right? Um, and there's police officers there. It's kind of a mess, really. And then the UFOs didn't come. The aliens didn't come. And the seekers just kind of figured it out. They just, just they rationalized it as this happened or that happened, or maybe they did come. Charles was, was quoted by a newspaper saying, no, they came. You just didn't see them. They were in the crowd. You just didn't see them. And then Dorothy Martin would go off and kind of do more work in the in the UFO cult world. And so would Charles Loffett as well. They just didn't stop. That, that cognitive business allowed them to say, oh, the aliens, we were dead wrong about the prediction, but also we're still right about the prediction. So they could hold both those ideas in once. Leon Fessinger then went back, wrote a book, called named it cognitive dissonance and now we have this handy terminology to talk about how screwed up human beings are in the head all of us by the way we all practice cognitive dissonance not just ufo cults we all do um here's another one here's another one where doomsday was important to the cult this is uh Pyotr kutsanov father Pyotr. uh he started a cult called heavenly jerusalem in russia they just showed up at the small town one day uh he would sleep in coffins with like multiple women and he would always preach, the end is coming. He named the date, uh, uh, the end is coming, the Great Tribulation, all the stuff in the Book of Revelations. It wasn't anything, any kind of new ideologies. All the stuff in the Book of Revelations, the Great Tribulation, Christ returning, demons everywhere, battles. And he said, the only way we're going to survive this, well, first off, they would stay away from UPC codes. They wouldn't buy anything with UPC code. They would stay away from television sets. Uh, again, it's more of a fishbowl effect, but you know, also because he didn't want to be tainted by the mark of the beast. So anyway, you know, one day, this small little town in snowy Russia, um, all the cult members, members disappeared. Nobody knew where they were until finally they realized they were in a cave outside of town. So they had found a bunker and dug it out into a cave and they were all going to live in this cave underground for like six months until the great tribulation was over and they could emerge and be among the chosen and be unscathed. Um, there's about 30, 35 of these people, except for Pyotr Kutsinov. Uh, he told them that he couldn't be in the cave because his destiny was elsewhere. So again, another ex another example of the rules of the uh, organization not applying to the leader. So he, he he didn't go in there. He sealed them up in the cave. And then he ended up getting arrested and taken to a psych ward. Um, and then the police came, the officials of Russia, they came and found a way to talk to these, these cult members in the cave. You see here, they're talking down a stovepipe, basically a chimney. Uh, and, and they had everything down there. They had food. They had propane gas for, for cooking. They were warm. They were underground. They were... They and the Russians wisely, the Russian authorities wisely just said, you know what? They're they're healthy. They're not hurting anybody. We're just going to monitor them and try to talk them out over time, right? They didn't do a Waco siege, right? They didn't do you know, tanks running over buildings. They just said, we'll just wait them out. They're fine right now. Let's wait them out. And that's what they did. They waited them out. They got Pyotr even to kind of come over and say, hey, guys, I was wrong. Can you guys just come out? But again, uh the the group said, no, 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 you've been tainted by the government. The mark of the beast is on you. We don't believe you anymore. We're staying underground. So again, that's cognitive dissonance where Pyotr told us to do this, so we're doing this. Pyotr told us not to do this, so we're going to do this. Um, so they stayed in there, and eventually what happened happened. They started slowly leaving. They started getting tired. The children would come out. The, the, the part of the cave would collapse and separated some of the people. So they came out. And generally, over the course of months, I think May 1999 uh, or something like that, they all came out. Uh, only two died, and they died of what was determined to be natural causes. And actually, they helped the exodus because they were just dead bodies kind of like gassing up the place. So um, they all finally left. And again, they would not have jumped in that hole if the end times were coming, right? You're not going to jump in the bunker unless the bombs are landing. And then they believed the bombs were landing. And if, if uh, Pyotr hadn't set a date, hadn't made that urgency, they would never have done this. So that urgency is super important to um to getting um people to do what you want to do in all in all acts of life right <laughs> this is almost a lesson on how to live life not just avoid cults all right number five um the organization impoverishes members by fundraising intensely from their pockets and estates right i mean all all religious organizations fundraise and ask for money they all have plates they pass around um but most religions have learned to establish themselves you don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg you let them keep laying the eggs but usually cults go too far and just take everything they impoverish their members partly that's to fund the cult partly that's to line the pockets of the leader um, but mostly it's also another control mechanism it's another fishbowl because um if you're poor it really restricts you right poverty traps and that's basically what you do to your followers if you're trying to run a cult uh, the example i want to tell you about in this one is an interesting one because of 
it's, it's the, one of the few cases, and the only case I know of cult members suing the cult leader to get their money back uh, and learning they were a fraud. This is the Divine Order of the Royal Arms of the Great Eleven, also called the Blackburn Cult. Uh, it was two women, a mother and her daughter, Ruth, um, and they believe that the Archangel Gabriel was visiting them at night, dancing with them, and telling them secrets of the world, and, he, and Gabriel wanted them to write in the book. So he started writing this book, telling people about this book, and one of the secrets this book was going to reveal was these pockets of treasure all over the planet. So they started fundraising, they started getting people together, people wanted to know where these treasures were, wanted to be part of something, um, they started you know, getting... Wealthy people. One of their members was a the son of an oil magnate, and he donated like two million dollars in you know hundred year old money, right? Two two million dollars to the to the group. They were to buy land and like build all these fancy scepters and staffs. They had weird weird kind of um, rituals. A lot of people disappeared in this cult. Often husbands of <laughs> Mary and Ruth. So there's a suspicion that they poisoned them. They did find a body under the floorboards of a dead girl. Uh, who probably died of natural causes, and they pretended it was, she was going to resurrect, so they put her in the floorboards. There's rumors that they killed somebody in a baking oven. So there's all these rumors of deaths and disappearances in this cult, why these women would write this book. And they, they never showed the book. They kept saying, it's not done yet, it's not done yet. And eventually they went to court, uh, not because of the deaths. They, those were never proven or disproven. They were taken because a few of the members, including that um, oil scion, said, hey, these guys are frauds. We want our money back, right? which seems, you know, seems pretty reasonable. Uh, but here's what the court said, and this is why I've included them tonight. Any legislative, any legislative attempt to limit or regulate persons and their claims to the possession of exceptional spiritual um, information or knowledge will be rejected as dangerous invasion of the state in the realm of religious freedom. Um, basically, what he's saying is we can't do that. We can't tell you which organizations are true and which are false when it comes to religion, right? But it's not what this country does. There's a, there's a you know, a wall separating the state and and religion, right? Uh, we can't start backing religions and saying these guys are true, like they you, they deserve your money, and these aren't. You shouldn't give them their money, um, which is again that makes sense, right? The, but the, what they're saying is we can't legislate. They're, they're all organizations, our cults and religions are all kind of the same, right? Which is kind of where I went went earlier in the in the talk. But the Blackburn cult, <laughs> the Divine Order of the Royal Eleven, or whatever, they also didn't come off on scathe from the from the from the judge. What he said about them was. A, they called the cult a babble of incoherency, abounding in absurdities, of an extreme type. And the wonder of it is that the rational mind should have become obsessed by such chimerical delusions. What he was saying was basically, you know, like buyer beware, caveat emptor. He was saying believer beware. If you believe hogwash, then, you know, that's your bat. Is basically what he's saying. Because, again, we can't tell you. You have to decide that for yourself. And I'm surprised that you guys thought this was true, but you did. So, and again, it's easy to bust on a small cult for weird ideas, but all religions have weird ideas. It just some have become so um, so ingrained in our culture. We know them so well that they they stop sounding weird. They just sound kind of normal. We've just heard them all our life. They've been normalized. But I love this because again, it's an example of you know uh, um, trying to get your money back from a cult is just not going to happen. This <laughs> is not going to happen. Six. I got two more for you tonight, and I'll stop. Um, the organization expounds ideas that are an unoriginal mishmash of the teachings of other organizations. Uh, this is important to me. I love this one. If you are a cult, that means you're a new religion, right? You need a reason for being new. Like, where were you a thousand years ago? Where are you 500 years ago? So if you're new, you really should have a revelation, something earth shattering, something I had never heard before. Like if you are, uh, have a, just a straight pipe to a Supreme being or to an advanced extraterrestrial race, those guys should know th more things than I know, right? <laughs> they should tell me something that I've never heard of that kind of shakes my reality and changes what I know of reality. But most cults don't. They have a, just, a, just a mismatch of Christian teachings and Muslim teachings. And, um, you know, the self-help cults just are a mismatch of common sense and self-help, other self-help tenets. Um, all of them just kind of borrow from each other. Like they're, they're, no cult has ever brought a new idea to the fore. And that's kind of how you know they're a cult. They're, oh, okay, you're just saying the same old things in a slightly different way. Why, why, you know, why do you exist? The only exception I found for people being able to give me a reality-shaking idea, I'm going to tell you about right now. Yeah, let's get that one. Um, Breatharianism. Uh, Wiley Brooks came on the scene in the 1970s on a show called That's Incredible, in which people would come on. This, this it was a hosted show. People would come on and do incredible feats uh, with their bodies and minds. That was incredible, right? And Wiley Brooks' uh, bit of incredibility was he could lift massive amounts of weights even though he was rail thin. He had no real muscle mass, but he could lift a lot of weights. 
And it was incredible. And they asked him, why can you do this? Why do you have this ability? And he shocked them all by saying, it's because I haven't had a bite of food in 17 years. <laughs> I've only lived off air. This is mind blowing to me, right? I've heard my whole life, you need food to eat. What if you don't? Like, what if you don't? Um, so this, this hit big and he, he got called in all the talk shows and kind of ex extrapolated on his, on his ideology and just said, yes, no, food is an alien substance you're uh, putting in your body. It's toxic. You don't, don't need to do that. Um, what, what you just need the air, the air you breathe is all you need with the exception of polluted air. If the air is slightly polluted, maybe some juice, maybe a salad, do something like that. And people like this idea, right? And you kind of get it, right? We have a weird relationship with the food, right? It's very expensive. It'd be nice to get that budget item off uh, that line item off the budget. It's very anxious, right? We're always worried about our weight or is this healthy or is this processed or is this good for me? It, it's, it's, we have so many anxieties over our food. It'd be nice if we could just throw the whole thing out and just breathe, right? Um, and he attracted a following and with this amazing, crazy idea that nobody ever heard. Um, and he fell apart when he was busted coming out of a 7-Eleven with a Twinkie. Some say it was a chicken pot pie, but I like, like, like the idea of it was a Twinkie instead. So this guy was sneaking junk food on the side is what he was doing. He wasn't living off air at all. And he wasn't even living off healthy food. Uh, he once called the, uh, later on after he's already, um, kind of, uh, debased, he called like the Big Mac, the perfect food ever in the universe that it's, it rang at a certain frequency. Um, but it, anyway, when he was kind of shown to be a fraud, uh, some of his closest adherents came out and was like, yeah, he also just like hangs out in hotel rooms and orders tons and tons of room service. It's kind of what he does. Um, and interestingly enough, again, cognitive dissonance, um, what they would say, what his followers would say was, yes, Wiley Brooks is a fraud. But breatharianism is not. We know it works. We just know that Wiley Brooks is a fraud. So they, again, they wanted to keep both those ideas in their head that Wiley Brooks is wrong, but breatharianism was not. Um, so very interesting idea, though, that you can just live off air. So interesting that it keeps popping up. So after Wiley Brooks is gone, uh, Ellen Grieve, who is Australian, uh, she called herself Jazz Muheen. She started selling breatharianism. She made books. She wrote books about it that actually killed people. Um, a couple of people in Australia were found starved to death with her book, right right beside them basically um she was so confident in her ideas though that she went on australia 60 minutes they said listen we'll film you for a week of not eating and make a documentary out of it she's of course easy easily done i do it all the time years and years and years of not eating so she gets on the show four days in she is hallucinating she is weak she's on the edge of death and they just had to stop stop filming it and just iv her full of sustenance which again it's amazing to me that you know she was so confident that she could go without food that she did it in front of TV cameras and couldn't. Um, uh, Ricardo and Costello, that's a married couple that they run regular seminar, sem seminars as late as 2017 on how to eat. Modern breatharianism doesn't go so extreme as to say only air, but they do say very, very low quality quantities of food. Nicholas Pilarts, who runs a, the Pranic Institute, Prana is a, a is a Hindu concept where you can you can ingest energy from the air. It's not meant to like be totally sustaining, but it's a concept. So they kind of tie that into breatharianism and say you don't need to eat very much. Um, and this also happened in the Victorian times. The, the papers are full of like people coming in and saying I haven't eaten in ten years, and they follow them around until they busted them eating a donut or whatever. So again, it's a strange idea, but it's been around forever. It just kind of surprised me. And it's one of those reality shaking ideas, if true, <laughs> right? Uh, that kind of blew my mind. My favorite one um, was Cyrus T and the Christian unity. Uh, the Christians believed that we were we that the Earth was hollow, which is not um, that strange. There's a lot of hollow Earth cults out there, um, but their interesting thing, their kind of mind blowing idea, was that the Earth is hollow, and every one of us right now in this room are inside the hollow Earth already. We live inside a solid sphere, and it's eight thousand miles in circumference. China is eight thousand miles that way. And then all the uh, aerial phenomenon, the sun, the stars are either optical illusions or there is stuff up there that, you know, kind of we can kind of see. So they spent their entire life. They were uh, in Astero, Florida. They had a commune in Astero, Florida, trying to prove that the ground was convex, right? They did all these science experiments that the ground was convex. And, um, you know, it's, it's amazing. Again, that shakes my mind that somebody could believe or that this idea could even exist that we are in a hollow sphere. Outside the sphere in their cosmogony is nothing, void. Because uh, then their idea was... We are finite creations, so God would not make an infinite creation to befuddle us. Uh, he would make a finite creation for a finite being, which, you know, makes a little bit of sense. So that's what they believe. They're actually one of the more gentle cults. There's no abuses. They're pretty progressive, actually. They were the first ever to, one of the first uh, areas to, to put in electricity. 
Edison came down to check out their installation. They would have they had arts, very big art programs. They'd have schools that people let people all over the all over the state come in. They had a ruling board of seven women back when you 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 know you weren't allowed to do that. So again, but again, their whole point was we live inside a hollow sphere, which again is a mind blowing revelation, if true. <laughs> so that's what I want from a cult. I need you to blow my mind, uh, but it also has to be true. Um, so that's six. Uh, seven is easy one. I'll just throw at the end before I summarize everything. The organization has a boring name. I don't know why this is. Uh, I don't know if marketers are less drawn to cults or if they're just trying to hide, you know, certain nefarious practices behind a very, very, gen very generic, nice, un un unseeable name. But I put together a quick list. Home of Truth, People's Temple, Heavenly Jerusalem, Children of God, Rune of Fellowship Church. They're just not interesting names. So they're so inter interesting that even though I've researched everyone in this list, I get them confused all the time. The Community of Jesus versus the Family International and Fellowship of Friends. Right now, I couldn't tell you which cult was which. Um, but for some reason, cults do that. They don't have cool names. Uh, they're not all Breatharians, which isn't a cool name either, but um, at least it's not generic, like um, Movement for the Restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. All right, so that's kind of the seven points. And I told you I tied this all together at the end. Um, two things you always hear about cults is, one is how could rational people, intelligent people, be fooled to going into cults with these extravagant ideas? And what I'm going to tell you, though, is that joining a cult is the most human thing you can do. All joining a cult is, is joining a group of like-minded people who want to see themselves as different from the rest of the, the planet of people. And they all organize under an impressive leader. We do that every single day in our families, in our jobs, our corporations, our towns, our states, right? Even if that difference is, you know, we were born in Maryland, we're Marylanders. We like to have, uh, we just join together with like-minded people under an oppressive leader. That's all a cult is. So it's not that, you know, um, you have to be completely weird. It's that cults are one of the most normal things you can do. And that's what makes them terrifying. That one of the most human, one of the most normal things you can do can almost inevitably end in abuses and, um, you know, losing your family and, 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 and crimes. Uh, it, it just, that's, that's way more scary than the ideology of most cults, honestly. And the second thing I want to say we always ask ourselves, would I be gullible enough to join a cult? Could I join a cult? Like I, I couldn't, right? I would. I don't need. I don't need these seven red flags. I would be, you know, my 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 own intellect and experience would help me steer clear of ever joining a cult. And I'm going to tell you that in my experience, that's not the right question. Uh, that question is actually, it's not. Am I? I'm too intelligent. Am I too intelligent to join a cult? It's would I, at my lowest point in my life, in the middle of a crisis, turn down help? That's the actual question. I, I can I um compare it to drowning, right? If you're a drowning person and somebody reaches their hand out of a boat to grab it, you don't question that hand. You don't see who's behind it. You will demand to see their driver's license. You just grab that hand desperately. And if that crisis, that drowning is a uh, crisis, a family crisis, uh, a financial crisis, you're drowning. That Those things are hard. If you're at the bottom of the barrel, if somebody reaches down to that barrel, you're just going to grab it. And then once you're in that boat, I keep mixing my metaphors here, but once you're in that boat, you don't care where it's going. You're just relieved to not be drowning. Like you're not thinking about anything else, but I'm not drowning. This is great. This is a great life. I'm not drowning. But over time, you might start thinking like, what's going on here? I'm seeing some things that make me suspect. I don't really understand what's going on. But by that time, the boat is so far gone and you are so far from where you started. Your only options are to stay in that boat, see where it goes or to jump back in the water where you were drowning. And that is an impossible, impossible situation. So the question is never, you can never say I'm too smart to join a cult. The question is, have I just hit that point where I would do anything to not drown anymore? And the answer to that is, you know, we all do that. If you haven't yet, you will at one point. Um, but again, cult. just to summarize, cults are the most human thing you can do. And when we're at our most vulnerable, is when we will turn to cults um, or whoever's nearby, right? Especially if our friends are pulling us into it. So that's it. That's all I got. If you want more information about me, I, you know, oddthingsivescene.com is my website. I have tons of writing there. I travel all over the place looking for weird stories and weird things. Um, but yeah, that's it. I'll stop sharing now and turn it over to Jeff. I'm more than happy to stay and ask answer questions if you guys have any. Um, or if that's enough cult talk for you tonight, I totally understand as well, because cults are a lot. Cults are a lot. Yeah, if you have any questions, um, you can just put them in the chat here. Um, Victoria said, very excited to read the book. 
Yeah, and the book is very, they're, again, they're, 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 the range, some of these cults are very abusive, very shocking, and some are kind of cool. <laughs> Honestly, they're not bad. They're not bad cults. They didn't do anything nefarious. They just had weirdo ideas, and I always love weirdo ideas. So there is a range in this book um, that'll keep you uh, interested, I think, of the 30 cults. Emily said, so interesting. Thank you. Um, Sakin said, thank you. That was amazing. Um, another thank you from Troy and Michelle. Michelle said, this was great. Enjoying the book. Uh, I enjoyed the book from Sydney. Book <laughs> horrifying, horrifying and fascinating. That's it. That should be on like the, that should be the blurb on the back. Um, well, I have a question. We're like, what, what's some like tidbit that you are, or cult that you, um, wanted to include was just, you know, just, just didn't make the cut. Um, probably the best one, my, my editor really wanted to push for, um, QAnon to be in here, right? They wanted something like a little bit more, you know, a little bit more in your face, like a little bit more like quite like, wait, is this a cult? They wanted it to be a lot, not less like, of course, Branch Davidians, definite cult, uh, Heaven's Gate, definite cult. They wanted something to be a little bit more uh, controversial. Um, and I was, I was totally up for that. But um, again, the lawyers came in and are like, uh, <laughs> maybe not, maybe don't do that cult, all right? Or that group and don't call them a cult. Um, we got a couple of questions here from Michelle and Emily. Uh, which cult would you be most likely to join? Oh, a UFO cults. I love UFO cults. Like, um, there's something about this idea that the UFOs are coming to save us or to interact with us at all that I am always drawn to, right? I, I, I want that secret information from extraterrestrials. I don't, I don't want it to be a supreme being or an apocalypse or our own war. I want it to be finally we have contact with aliens and they're coming to show us a good time and take us away to like a really cool place. So I, I would I would be very much, I'd probably be like Leon Fassinger and joining, infiltrating uh, uh, the Seekers. They, they just seem like fun. <laughs> um, do you have any recommendations for like film or books as far as cult fiction? There, are, there's a the um, probably a really good one. One of my favorite books I read doing this was um, the Sullivanians, actually. So every one of these cults, almost every one of these cults, has their own book dedicated to them because they're they're that detailed. Sullivanians just came out a couple of years ago where they where they really dig into this cult and interviews actual members because it's a rel it's a recent cult, so it's not like a 19th century one. That one is fascinating because again, middle of New York, it's built around psychology. It's not real built around religion and the fact that you know. Even when you take away religion, a lot of people like again, a lot of people sideline cults as like being you know religious religious people, right? They're they're gullible, whatever they believe anything. But you take away religion, we'll find something else to believe in and and be abused by that. So uh, I, I'm I, that's a big that's a good book, Helter Skelter, The Manson Family. It's a classic book. Um, but there's some really they're always big, giant books, but there's some really good books out there. Any like movies that you that that, that like you would say? Um, <laughs> like I said, a lot of lot, are good a fiction. lot of documentaries. My favorite cult movie, though, probably there's two movies. Probably The Wicker Man, right? Just classic, right? It's, it's uh, a right, yeah. island in the UK, right? Christopher Lee. That is a that's like your perennial. That's cult. When you think of a cult in classical terms, you kind of think of that. Also, a movie called um, I think it's called uh, The Visitation. And it's about this dinner party. The entire time it's a dinner party, but it, it starts getting culty at some point. It's really good. The, the, is it called The Invitation? Th that's probably what it is. The Invitation. That's probably what it is called. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That was very... Somebody said great cult movie, The Sacrament. That is a good one as well. I agree with Matt. I usually agree with Matt, actually. Well, I also like All the Colors of the Dark. It's like an old Italian movie, but... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I like Italian film for sure. Yeah, it's a good one. But um, I don't know if we have anybody asking any more questions. Um, I don't think I see any more questions, but um, if that's it, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you, JW. Um, uh, please check out his book. Um, we have a couple that we're raffling off, so please check out your. Uh, please check your emails uh, on the lookout in case you're a winner. Um, and yeah, check out his book. Uh, check out his website, uh, Things I've Seen. Um, and 
Uh, we have another event next week. Um, uh, we're talking with Tim Wagoner, who wrote X, uh, the novelization of the of the movie starring Mia Goth. So we have that coming up. Oh, Tim's and, good. I get his news. He's got a good news. If you're a writer, he's got a good new, or like a writer newsletter. You should definitely, definitely gotta get that. Cool. So um, yeah, we have that coming up next week, and check out our uh, social media for other events coming up. And uh, thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Yep. Thanks for being my guinea pigs for my first talk on this. Appreciate it, guys. Mm -hmm.